scriptures tonight. And uh, I want to return to uh, Exodus chapter number one. We'll be focused there some. But we're going to be jumping around. If someone could look up Genesis 2, Genesis 2, 16 and 17, I know it's kind of uh, something we're familiar with. If someone else could up, up, look up Genesis 41, 39 through 44. Proverbs 29, 2. So just keep your finger there. It'll be a little while before I get to some of those. So we're going to be looking, like I said, at Exodus, the beginning of that chapter. Well, let's start out tonight in Galatians, chapter number 5, in verse number 1. I hope that we can do a few things tonight. Number one, I hope that we can understand the signs of the time and why they're there. And I made some remarks in the opening, just, uh, you know, how wicked the world is growing. Uh, it can be discouraging. I'm not talking about politically. I'm talking about just um, when we look at where the world is and how far from God that they are. Uh, it's, it's, um, it can be heart-wrenching to the child of God particularly as we're saturated in the Word of God and living in the Spirit, and we realize that God wants a holy people. He requires it. He wants it to see how far from the mark that we are. So as, as we look at that, what's God up to? What is all this? Oh, I think it's a double-edged sword. And I, 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 I plan to be able to look at some different angles of that tonight. And hopefully for us as believers end up on a very positive note that will encourage us, even when we hear of, of um, just things that, that mar the holiness of God. Not that we find any pleasure in it, but that it will bring hope to us. And so uh, that's, that's my goal. And so Galatians chapter number 5, verse number 1, Paul is dealing with um, liberty that's being threatened by by, by real legalism. And so uh, uh, he says this. He said, Stand fast, therefore, in the liberty where Christ has made us free, and be not entangled again with the yoke of bondage. Amen. Stand fast, uh, therefore, in the liberty where Christ has made us free, and be not entangled again with the yoke of of bondage. There's something that is a theme throughout the Word of God. And when, when we look um, from Old to New Testament, you will be seeing this theme that God sets people free. I think that's one of the greatest things, that's the greatest message of Jesus Christ is that there is freedom. And so uh, we find in the Old Testament where God speaks to uh, Moses and he says, Go to Pharaoh and say to Pharaoh, uh, 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 Thus saith the Lord, let my people go. The people of God live in freedom. Amen. There's a real freedom that we live in. Uh, just uh, freedom. <laughs> I, I, I dealt with someone some time ago that was dealing with their mortality, dealing with making their wishes for the end of life, dealing with needing to tell their children, and uh, uh, came to a point uh, where they wanted to talk to me, and, and uh, when they talked to me, they had a big boulder in their road of life that they needed to remove. And uh, that boulder uh, was simply someone had given wrong done them. And they, they needed to know what tools they could use to find forgiveness because they wanted freedom. 
I, I wouldn't have thought that was as big a boulder as some they already had faced and whatever, but you know what the desire of the heart was, was for freedom. Amen. And where the Spirit of the Lord is, there's liberty. Amen. When Christ is set free, is free indeed. The message of, of throughout the Word of God is, let my people go. And Jesus stands up in the synagogue and He says, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me because He hath anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captives, and recovering of the sight to the blind, and set at liberty them that are bruised. Amen. God's whole design for man from the very beginning was that man would experience freedom. Amen. Freedom. What a great thing. Amen. Uh, 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 when God created Adam, he, he didn't constrain his choices. He allowed Adam to have free will. We each are born after Adam with that free will. But God desired from Adam, uh, from the beginning to Adam and all men to live in freedom. But someone read Genesis 2, chapter, uh, chapter number 2, 16 and 17. If you to read that. Here you are, Adam. You can have all the freedom in the world. But if you do this, if you partake of this tree, your freedom ends. You will die. So Adam's put to the test. And that's familiar to us. He's put to the test. And you know what Adam did in the Garden of Eden? He surrendered his God-given freedom. That's what he did. And, uh, and so from that day on, man would be ruled by another man. They would do it out to see who would rule man. And so uh, we find that thankfully because of the grace and the mercy of God, from time to time, he would place leadership over his people that would allow them to experience great freedom. Amen. And, and I believe that one person that was that great leader was Joseph. He allowed people to experience freedom through this leadership of Joseph. Someone read there Genesis 41, verse number 39 through 44. The Pharaoh said unto Joseph, For as much as God hath shown thee all this, there is none so discreet from wise as thou art. Thou shalt be over my house and can afford unto thy work. Shall all my people be ruled only in the throne will I be greater than them? And Pharaoh said unto the children, See, I have set thee over all the land of Egypt. And Pharaoh took all his bread from his hand, put it upon Joseph's hand, and arrayed him in vestments of fine linen, and put a gold chain about his neck. And he made him and he made him to ride in the second chariot which he had, and they cried before him, bowed the knee, and he and he was made ruler over all the land of Egypt. And Pharaoh said unto Joseph, I am Pharaoh, and without thee shall no man lift up, lift up his hand or foot in all the land of Egypt. Wow. So God gives Joseph this man. The children of Israel are carried away into this captivity. There they are. And, and, and so Joseph is, is there. And we find that as Joseph is, is there, and there's, there's, there's blessing coming from, from Egypt because God did not spare to give Joseph the authority to, uh, to everything that's said and done. Joseph has the authority over. And so his leadership, his absolute universal authority that was over Egypt uh, because Joseph had a heart after God. It, 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 it increased the freedom for, for the people of God that would be there. And, and we find that uh, the Word of God says that when there are righteous leaders in authority, the people rejoice, but wickedness beareth rule, the people mourn. Here is a godly man who is in leadership, and the authority that he has, and the freedom that he gives. 
And so we find that Joseph leads uh, 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 Egypt and, 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 and Israel through this time where there's predicted seven years of plenty, but then there's seven years of famine. And Joseph is so wise in his dealings and in his authority that he takes care of everyone. And everyone is well taken care of. Godly authority. How awesome is that? When there's godly authority and godly leadership, thank God when we have godly leadership. But I need to tell you, there's a change. Something happens. Here's God's people. They're blessed under Joseph. Joseph's godly leadership. The blessings are there. But we start reading in Exodus chapter number 1. And go with me. Now these are the names of the children of Israel which came into Egypt. Every man in his household came with Jacob. They come. Famine, they come. I'm not going to go down through all the names. Verse number 6. And Joseph died. And all of his brethren. And all that generation. Joseph died. And all that generation. Here it is. There's a finality that all happens in this verse. That this godly leadership is gone. And era ends. It ends. It's done, Mr. God. The era of Joseph, his godliness, his godly wisdom, his godly leadership, it ends. It's done. It's over. I want to stop here and pause for a moment before I read any further. When I read this, it burdens me. Because I see it on a lot of levels, but I see it on the church level. A lot of us have experienced folks in our lives who are prayer warriors, folks who know how to pray down heaven, folks who lived righteous, folks who stand up. Uh, they were the Matthew 7 7 people. They kept on asking, they kept on seeking, they kept on knocking. We know those people. Some of them have having great influence over our life. The kind of Christian that never quits. But they go off the scene too. Some of you know some of those people in your lives. It's a sad day when that era ends. And the Bible says, and the children of Israel were fruitful and increased abundantly and multiplied and waxed exceedingly mighty. And the land was filled with them. Do you know why Israel, they multiplied? <clears throat> because of Joseph's leadership. And, and they didn't forget about Joseph after he was gone. They knew about him. They remembered him. But however, let's read on to the next verse. And there arose a new king over Egypt, which knew not Joseph. And he said to the people, Behold, the people, the children of Israel, are more mightier than, than we. Here it is. It's not that this new king had not heard or known about Joseph. He knew. He knew about the plenty that came. He knew about the dream. He knew about the famine. He knew about the seven good years, the seven bad years. He knew all about that. But what the Word of God is telling us, he disregarded all of it. He disregarded the love for God. He disregarded a trust in God. He disregarded wanting to rule a nation in God's way. He, he, he did not know Joseph. And so here it is that the, the leadership, uh, the succession that comes in Egypt uh, uh, knew all about that, but they didn't care about Joseph and they certainly didn't care about God. Wow. That marks two things that I'm thinking of tonight. That can mark the church. We cannot have a godly love for God the way that, 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 that it has been in the past and the way that it should be, the way that God has moved and, and increased and blessed. And it certainly means that on a higher level. I don't want to get ahead of myself when we think about our nation 
and what and God we trust written on our, our, our money and how that that is swiftly changing and, 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 and what used to be a godly uh, 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 leadership that we had, that leadership's not. We look at the prosperity. We look at what's been given to us. But there's a great neglect in the church and in the world. You see, Israel was still God's people. But the influence of the world, Egypt, began to come down hard on them because they wanted nothing to do with God. They wanted nothing to do with righteousness. They wanted nothing to do with the flourishing that had, that, that, that had blessed them so bountifully before. You know, there are many people who know about Azusa Street revivals. There's many people who know about uh, tent revivals. There's many people who know about great healings that have taken place. Uh, uh, but, but, you know, churches have become such that, that, that there's no revivals anymore. There's no seeking of God. There's no desiring for, for, for that of, 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 of divine healing and, and praying and fasting and seeing God work and move and folks being baptized with the Holy Ghost and, 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 and preachers preaching a message where there's discerning of spirits and, 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 and they talked about the spiritual famine that's coming. It's all all being forgotten about. It's concerning. It's concerning, Joseph. You're being forgotten about. You see, they want the results of Joseph, but they don't want to put the time in with God. The church really does want the results, but it calls for some faithfulness to God. We know the story of Joseph. I'm not going to go through every nook and cranny of, of his life. But if there's one man that could have been unfaithful, if there's one man that could have been bitter, if there's one man that could have thrown the towel, it was Joseph. All the adversities that, that but, but with every step that he took, every suffering that he went through, he was still trusting God and God was working and moving in his life and he was looking for a bigger picture and he was holding on to the promises of God and looking for God to move in a nation. You see, before Joseph died, the Bible says that the children of Israel were were increasing abundantly in verse number 7. They multiplied and they, were, uh, they, 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 they lacked exceeding mighty. The land was filled with them. This new king was concerned about that. You see, he had a problem on his hands. But he didn't realize that the problem was that God had promised Abraham that he was going to unfold a great nation from him. So even though he tried to stop the people of God, you cannot stop the hand of God from His promises. Even though there was oppression that was put upon the people of God, God was still going to be faithful to them. I hope you can understand where I'm going without me, me simply saying everything. God has made promises to the church. God has made promises to us. And no matter how hard the world is, amen, no matter how much we're threatened, amen, God is going to bless. And so the children of Israel, I, I want you to know that they weren't enslaved overnight. You see, all of a sudden the Bible says that there rose up a new king and he said to the people, uh, come on, let us deal wisely with them lest they multiply and come to pass that when, the, when, when there was uh, their father out any, uh, out any war, they join also unto our enemies and fight against us and so get them up out of, out of the land. We're blessed because of these people. But, but I need to tell you, we've got to put our hand down on them. We don't, we don't want them getting out of hand. We don't want them joining alliances with someone who maybe would come against us. And the Bible says, Therefore they did set over them taskmasters to afflict them with burdens. So they're going to give them burdens to bear. And they're going to have taskmasters. And, and the Bible says that, 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 that they built treasures uh, under Pharaoh's cities. Python and Ramsey. The Bible says... But the more they afflicted them, the more they multiplied and grew. Church, do you hear what the Word of God says tonight? 
that the more that they afflicted them, the more that they multiplied and grew. Just because the world is getting wicked, just because Christians, it seems like our rights are stripped, just because they're putting the pressure down. Let me tell you why America is what America is. Because of God. Because the people of God. Amen. You know why the church still flourishes? Because people love God. Amen. And they trust God. They remember Joseph. And they remember how Joseph flourished. And they continue the same way. Amen. So if the church be oppressed. Amen. Don't get discouraged. Don't throw in your hat. Don't throw in your towel. Amen. Know that God flourishes His people even in the face of adversity. When you look at the news, don't get discouraged. Amen. But know that God is going to flourish His church even in difficult times. And so, this affliction happened. The Bible says, the more they afflicted them, the more they multiplied and grew, and they were grieved because of the children of Israel. Rigor, break them, crush them, clamping down on them, but it didn't stop their expansion. Verse number 14 says, and they made their lives bitter with hard bondage, in mortar and in brick, and in all manner of service in the field, all their service wherein they made them serve was with rigor. Amen. They were trying to break them into pieces, but yet they're flourishing. Do you ever feel like the world's trying to break you into pieces? Don't crumble. Because God has a way of flourishing His people when the rigor of the world is put upon us. The Bible says this, and ye shall be hated of all men for my name's sake, but he that shall endure to the end, the same shall be saved. We are going to be afflicted. Jesus told us that because of our love for Him. Amen. But the good news is we can flourish. And when we endure to the end, we shall be saved. Amen. Just as the children of Israel uh, allowed themselves to become enslaved. So I, I think a lot of times uh, uh, the church has allowed ourselves to be enslaved overnight and, and, and with affliction. Amen. And, and, and it can drain us at times. Let me just talk to you about some things. What about the high school coach that loses his job for praying with his players on the field? What about the clerk who is jailed because she won't issue a marriage license to a same-sex marriage? That's in America. I need to tell you that we brought some slavery on ourselves too because of our lack of standing up, our becoming complacent in the world. What about the teacher who faces being fired for calling homosexuality a sin? What about those who go to church and there's a gunman there and waits the Bible study is over and then he kills several people? My mom was telling me today that now in preschools, and I'm thankful for the ability to still have good Christian preschools in our area, but now there are books that teach children at a very young age, even before school age, that they can choose what gender they want to be. I think that we as believers have enslaved ourselves in a world where we've not stood up. But I still believe that if we're faithful, we will flourish. I think these are issues that we as a church need to talk about. What about crosses being removed from public places? And what about Ten Commandments that are being removed? Monuments that are being vandalized because of, 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 of righteous things. 
You see, the bitter bondage took decades. And it's the same for us. It's a course of time that happens and it's trying to weaken the church. But I need to tell you that we as believers cannot forfeit our God-given freedoms. We've got to push aggressively against things that are anti-Christ. We may feel alone. We may feel like a small voice. We may feel like we're being oppressed. We may feel like it's rigorous from the world. But we still need to be a voice of truth. And know that God sees us and God will deliver us and God will flourish us. I believe that. When I read here uh, uh, of Joseph and his life, we think much about his life. But how often have we really thought about his death? How often have we thought about the events and everything that transpired with, with, with the nation of Israel who comes in at a time of plenty, but they find themselves captive because they, they, they don't stand. The world presses down. But God still blesses. And so... Sometimes I do ask myself, how do we get ourselves into so much bondage? Why the children of Israel did too. But God allowed them to be reduced to slavery for a reason. No more talk about that reason in closing. You see, if everything would have been flourishing there, Brother Dennis. The children of Israel would have never wanted to leave Egypt. It was a good food. It was comfortable. But all of a sudden, Joseph has gone from the scene. A king comes on board that doesn't regard Joseph and know Joseph. Doesn't regard God. And so, he has no heart for God. The kingdom is wicked. He is rigorous upon the people of God. And all of a sudden, the people of God begin to do something. God deliver us. We live pretty comfortable in this world. When's the last time? Not with lip service, but with heart service and great fervor did you pray to God. Even so, come quickly, Lord Jesus. You are our deliverer. Amen. I want you to know that the church will always be. God will always have a people. And God will cause those people to flourish spiritually. Amen. The world might try to press down. Amen. Our rights might be stripped away from us. We're in this world and we can become very comfortable. I think in past generations we have been. I think in this generation we're very comfortable. We live good. We don't pray hard for revival. We sometimes don't even put the energies into it. But know this. That the affliction comes because God is looking for people who will call out, deliver us. They started looking for delivering. God gave them Moses. Moses would go and say, let my people go. Do you realize that God gave us one that is greater than Moses? Amen. He gave His very own Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. Who liberated the captives. Amen. I, I, he is a liberator tonight. Amen. And all power is given unto me because of Jesus Christ. Amen. And His resurrection. So even in the most adverse of situations, we can stand for Jesus. Jesus Christ and we can flourish amen because the power of the cross and the power of Jesus Christ and the power of the Holy Ghost that he gave to us amen amen tonight we can flourish I want to ask you a question again are you living in freedom the word of God says he whom the Son sets free is free indeed. Some folks say, and I know the news is out of control. They say, I can't even watch the news. But when you watch the news, don't get discouraged. But let there be a stirring that even though the world 
presses down and they're rigorous. It's probably because we as believers became way too comfortable too long ago. But God has provided the deliverer, Jesus Christ. And he sets us free. And our heart's cry should be even so. Come quickly, Lord Jesus. They put their rigor down. They were oppressing them to build, to get out of them what they wanted. But then they told the midwives, kill all of it. No, we can't. We know the story of Moses. All the baby boys was being killed. His mom put him in a basket. And God says, the pressure's on. But you trust me. And I'm going to flourish you. Even when the pressure's on. If we will trust God. Others may compromise. Others may forget about God. Amen. But if we, the church, will stand in the liberty of Christ <coughs> right, has made us free, we will flourish. And one day, our exodus is going to be greater than a red sea that's opened. Amen. Because the eastern skies are going to open. Amen. And Jesus Christ isn't coming back anymore as the Lamb, but He's coming back as the Lion. Amen. 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 Even so, come quickly, Lord Jesus. Maybe you come in here with your heart, amen, a bit distracted, a bit overwhelmed by things. Amen. Maybe it feels like the world's forgotten about God and they have. Amen. They've forgotten about this nation. Amen. That was built because there were some folks who wanted to serve and love God. So they sought out a new country. Amen. And they put everything that they could in stock of finding a place where they could worship God in freedom. And they came here and this nation was built upon Jesus Christ and the principles of the Word of God. Amen. And even though the world is going crazy, even though they're, they're, they're trying to knock away the foundation foundations of Jesus Christ. Amen. Uh, even though it seems like the pressure is on the church, amen, know this tonight, that when the pressure is on, God can still flourish us. Amen. But let that desire in your heart rise up. Even so, come quickly, Lord Jesus. Even so, come quickly. I don't know, that's where I'm at tonight, folks. That's what I wanted to share. Amen. When our lives seem to be chaotic because of a world that's forgotten about God, when the pressure's on, God's want to flourish us. God's want to flourish us. Does anyone have anything that they want to say?